Good evening and welcome. I am Digvir Jais, Vice President Research and International at the University of Manitoba. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the University of Manitoba is on the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Welcome to this evening's topic of, for discussion, the research in motion, the latest advances in Parkinson's disease. Tonight's panel is made up of University of Manitoba expertise in this field of research. Under the guidance of your moderator this evening, the team will share their knowledge on the latest new technologies such as brain imaging and home-based digital rehab programs to further improve brain function. The cafe tonight is presented in partnership with Manitoba Neuroscience Network during National Brain Awareness Week. I would like to thank Dari Sherry Hanila for her collaboration on tonight's panel. This brings us to your moderator for this evening, Ms. Julie Wysowski is the Director of Research and Partnerships for Parkinson's Canada. She has a passion for ensuring health research is a priority and is committed to upholding the integrity of the research funding process. In her role, she is the strategic lead of Parkinson's Canada's research program, which includes the management of research partnerships, oversight of the peer review, and grant administrator processes, as well as the Canadian Open Parkinson Network, which seeks to integrate Parkinson's research hubs across Canada with the goal of accelerating discoveries. Julie will introduce our panel for tonight and process for your engagement. I encourage you to participate in the conversation with tonight's experts and pose many questions to challenge our experts. Thank you, Megwitch. Merci. Thank you, Dr. Jayas. Before we begin, I will give a quick overview of how we plan to proceed in our online Cafe Scientific format. Each of our panelists will speak briefly on their perspective based on their expertise in tonight's topic for discussion research in motion, the latest advances in Parkinson's disease. I will then open things up for questions and questions will be posed via Slido. That's uh, on your browser, www.slido.com. And the code for tonight is hashtag MAR15. There is a link in the YouTube description in this feed you are watching and also on the screen throughout the discussion. You don't need to download software to use this application. Just enter the browser and the discussion code. I'll be moderating questions from Slido as well as the interactions with the panelists this evening. And this brings me to tonight's expert panel, who are Dr. Douglas Hobson, Dr. Tony Sturm, Dr. G. Pine Cole. And so I'll do Dr. Hobson first. Dr. Hobson is a assistant professor of internal medicine, neurology at the Max Ready College of Medicine, where he completed his medical training. He is the director of the movement disorder program that runs out of the movement disorder clinic at Deer Lodge Center. He has been practicing as a clinical neurologist, movement disorder specialist, and educator in Winnipeg since 1987. His clinical involvement focuses on Parkinson's disease and related disorders. The clinic's, clinic's cash met area is the province of Manitoba, Eastern Saskatchewan, Western Ontario, and Nunavut. In 2019, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Award by Doctors Manitoba for services rendered to patients and the community. 
and in 2019 was honored to receive the Educator of the Year Award from the Association of Residents and Interns of Manitoba. Dr. Stern is a physiotherapist and with a PhD in neuroscience. He is a professor researcher in the College of Rehabilitation Sciences, Rady Faculty of Health Sciences. His research focus is in the area of mobility, limitations and cognitive decline in Parkinson's disease, acquired brain injuries and aging. He has developed several technologies that can make, a, make it possible to provide effective and monitored exercise rehab programs for balance, gait and cognitive impairments, to transition and function in community facilities, and ultimately home environments for safe, independent use in urban and rural communities. Dr. Cole holds a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Computer Engineering from the Hainang University in Seoul, South Korea, and a PhD in Neurological Science from McGill University. He did his postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto training in functional brain imaging in Parkinson's disease. Then he moved to New York to train in multivariate brain imaging analysis in Parkinson's disease. He joined the University of Manitoba and is currently an associate professor in the Department of Human Anatomy and Cell Biology at the Max Rady College of Medicine. So without further ado, I would like to ask Dr. Hobson if you can please make your remarks. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be able to do this. It's probably the first one I've done to the community virtually, so uh, appreciate the opportunity. So I'm a neurologist, uh, meaning I see patients in my office. Uh, I do some teaching at the university. Uh, one of the main conditions we look after at the Movement Disorder Clinic, where there are neurologists as well as allied health people, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and speech therapists, dietitian, social worker. So it really is a team approach, but we look after this condition called Parkinson's disease. This is a condition that was originally described by Dr. Parkinson back in 1817, and he actually only saw six patients, but he recognized they had similar features. It's uh, fascinating when you look at his report because he only saw two of the patients from across the street. He didn't actually see them in the office, but he managed to get all six cases published back then and was recognized to describe all of the major features clinically of this condition. So it's a condition that we don't have any blood tests or x-rays to diagnose. We have to get the, the history of the features as well as on examination, find the features that help us uh, explain what's changing for the patient. So in order to make a diagnosis of Parkinson's, you have to find slowness. The patients will come in, often it's their family that describe they're just walking slower, they're starting to look older, they might have lost some facial expression. And together with seeing slowness on examination, when you ask them to do things quickly and recognize they're just not as able to do them as fast, you're looking for two, one of two other things. A tremor, which is typically a tremor when they're relaxed, when their hands are either hanging at their side when they're standing or relaxing on the lap. It's called a pill rolling tremor because it's a, a to and fro tremor, kind of like you're rolling a pill between your thumb and your index finger. And the other feature we examine is to find out how tight or stiff their muscles are by moving their limbs around. Uh, so if we find somebody who's slow and has either tremor or rigidity or all three, we can say that they're Parkinsonian. The rest of the exam and the history is to rule out other conditions that can sometimes look like Parkinson's disease but aren't. And the most common Thing that you could mix up would be a side effects of certain medications. So it's always very important to make sure the patient isn't on medications that could sometimes mimic this condition. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So what goes wrong in the brain with Parkinson's disease? It turns out that uh, there's a collection of an abnormal protein that they've actually fairly recently figured out. It's called alpha synuclein. But for quite some time, the pathologists, when they look at the nerve cells, which is on the left there in that pink photograph, you can see a circle of 
pink debris with a bit of a white halo around it. And, and that was described quite a long time ago, but only about 10 years ago did they actually identify what's actually in there. And as I mentioned, it's alpha synuclein. And a pathologist looked at a whole series of Parkinson's patients' brains after they passed away and found out this abnormal protein seems to collect in the nerve to the nose to begin with, which is up at the front there, and probably explains why a lot of people before they come in with their tremor will start to notice a change in their sense of smell. Also starts way down in the brain stem at the bottom of the brain, and that part looks after bowel function. And so again, a lot of people before they come in with their tremor have had problems with constipation for many years. The pathology seems to sort of slowly spread up into the brain and that black arrow in the middle points at the midbrain. That's where the cells that make dopamine live. And they're unfortunately dying off. And once you lose about 80% of them, uh, you lose enough dopamine to create the symptoms of slowness, tremor, and rigidity. Uh, the pathology is, after diagnosis can continue to progress because this is a neurodegenerative disease. And as the pathology progresses into the upper parts of the brain, that's when people can get into memory problems. Uh, next slide. So these are the stages of Parkinson's. So we often don't know when somebody might have constipation or loss of sense of smell at that stage that they have Parkinson's disease. They don't know enough to come in and necessarily even complain about those things to, to their doctors. If we, this condition about 16% of the time runs in families. So occasionally we'll identify people that know their dad had Parkinson's, for example, and they're noticing a loss of sense of smell and constipation. So we might get a chance to see them when they're only at the prodromal stages and then follow them. The diagnosis in this picture you're looking at happens between the prodromal stage and the honeymoon stage, so at year zero. If the symptoms are bad enough to interfere with quality of life, although we don't have any medicine that can slow down the progression of the disease, we have medication that really can improve their symptoms. And uh, when we first start the medication, they Medications typically work very well, improves their stiffness, slowness, and tremor, and usually continue to work well for up to three years. And that's referred to as the honeymoon period. Over time, though, because the patient's own ability to make dopamine starts to fall off, they become much more dependent on each pill they take, and their individual pills may not create enough benefit to last till the next pill. So you start to get fluctuations in their response. And a lot of people have learned about Parkinson's from seeing Michael J. Fox in the media. And if you get too much dopamine, trying to get the patient to move faster, if you go over the top, they can get what are called dyskinetic movements or excessive twisting movements. And I think a lot of us have seen Michael J. Fox do that. So that, those are the fluctuations, wearing off from the pills working well at one hour and then not working well, putting up with stiffness and tremor, and then perhaps the pills kick in and are working too well, and then you have the dyskinesia. So that pattern is referred to as fluctuations. And we have different approaches and different medications to try to uh, replace the dopamine, and typically with a drug called levodopa. And then we have medications to try to make that levodopa work better and last longer. We also have chemical mimics of dopamine. Uh, they're called dopamine agus, agonists. It might last a bit longer. So there's a mixture of different medications we can use to help the patients. As time goes by, though, symptoms start to occur that we are not particularly good at looking after, particularly with medications. So memory can start to become a problem gradually. Uh, people can start to have balance problems and start to fall might have more difficulty with clarity of their speech or swallowing problems. And that's a stage where we really start to recruit help from the allied health uh, members in our clinic. So a speech therapist to assist with trying to improve the volume of patients speaking, uh, swallowing tests and give them guidance how to safely swallow. Physiotherapist help them with their balance or advise what uh, walking aid they might benefit from. 
And then as the disease advances, memory becomes a problem. And that it's particularly challenging, not only because the memory is an issue, but at that stage, you can't be as aggressive with the medications we use to help mobility because the medications themselves can impact memory. So as I mentioned to date, we don't have any medications that can slow uh, the progression down, but the more we learn about exercise, the uh, more we recognize it probably has a huge role to help slow down the progression of this disease. And uh, not only the patients, but the doctors and other staff looking after Parkinson's are, are really keen on research providing even better treatments in the future. So I'll stop there and uh, answer questions uh, when we get a chance later. You're muted, Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hobson. That was very informative. Um, so I will ask now Dr. Sturm um, to make his remarks. <clears throat> Greetings, everyone. I um, hope, hope everyone is enjoying this beautiful weather. I probably shouldn't say this, but I will anyways. Uh, I hope I can get out golfing in a couple of weeks by the beginning of April, which would be a really nice treat, uh, very early golf season. Um, as you heard, I'm a physiotherapist. My, my main area, I'm a professor and researcher, uh, and I also operate, help coordinate a free neuro clinic that we have every year for three months for training our physiotherapy students in the area of neuro, rehab, neuro rehabilitation. My focus is on mobility, uh, physical activity, and fall prevention. Uh, first slide, please. Um, First slides up. Okay, I have very limited vision. Uh, I'm still a good golfer though. Um, and it's hard to see these small images on the slide. So if, if we look at fitness in general terms, I'm sure you're, you're, you're fairly familiar with and aware of things that relate to cardiac fitness, muscle skeletal fitness, and there are many options there. Um, the more options we have, the more variety we have, I think the better it is for everyone. Um, some people like doing running, some people like resistance training, some people like boxing, some people like um, golfing, et cetera, et cetera. Having good variety of options is important. Um, it's one thing to say you need to do things for cardiac and muscle fitness. It's another thing to do it. Participation um, involves motivation and engagement. And if you like something, you're going to be engaged more, you're going to participate more. However, um, slide two, please. Next slide, please. Now, my main area of uh, interest in, in research is in something I refer to as neural fitness. So neural fitness and how it impacts on mobility. And I break down neural fitness into four main areas. One are core balance skills. A second one being our walking or our motor coordination skills. Our visual motor skills are very important when we're walking and navigating busy environments. Um, uh, uh, and uh, dealing with complex terrains. And our cognitive activities are also very important in mobility. Together, really, behavior, ambulation in the real world, again, while we're navigating through busy environments, uh, complex terrains, talking, reading, absorbing information, processing that information, you really are involved in all of these processes at once. So dual tasking, the ability to, to to blend balance activities, walking activities, with visual motor activities and cognitive activities, I think is a very important um, aspect and, and an important approach to try to achieve in a training program. Now, the basal ganglia, as described by Dr. Hobson, Doug, um, it has, it, it plays a very central role in many aspects of mobility. It's important in the balance functions. It's important in walking. It's important for a visual motor control system. And it, it actually, as he says, memory, but it also has other aspects of cognitive functions, things that we refer to as executive cognitive functions. So for example, processing speed, uh, being able to deal with, uh, with uh, multiple distractions, et cetera. So there's a lot of aspects to cognition that have to be dealt with during mobility behaviors. And the basal ganglia, again, has a role to play in every one of these. Next slide, please. Now, this, this slide has a lot of information on it, and it, and it is, will describe a recent research project that Dr. Cole 
myself, Doug, and a colleague in Toronto, Dr. Antonio Strafello, um, received funding from the Western Brain Institute to perform. It's going to be looking at this dual task treadmill training program that we developed. And let's focus on the training program first, but we, before we talk about the intervention and the brain imaging that we will do with this intervention to look at how brain plasticity might occur as a function of different um, exercise programs. If you look at the bottom left uh, of the slide, you see me wearing a baseball hat, walking on a treadmill, viewing a computer monitor. We take advantage of digital media, in particular computer games. There's lots and lots of really good computer games that are engaging for a number of people, not for everybody, but for a number of people that have excellent visual motor tasks and a wide variety of cognitive activities. We use vision, I'm viewing the monitor, I'm playing this game, I'm, I use vision to absorb um, that these, this, this information. I can absorb a lot of information with vision very quickly. The game requires me to process that information in different ways, depending upon the activity in the game. And uh, the game also requires me to produce a response. So I can give information to the individual and I can see what they do with that information by looking at the response. And I'm wearing this baseball hat and the baseball hat has this novel mouse. It's an air mouse. It's a motion mouse. It's not an optical mouse. Um, it works by rotation. I use this miniature mouse on the baseball cap and this allows me to use small head rotations to interact with the computer game. Just like you would with a normal mouse, I use head pointing movements to control the motion of the game sprite or the cursor or the game pad. And every two or three seconds, I'm absorbing information, I'm producing responses. It's hands-free, so I can walk while I'm doing this. So here you have a dual tasking, multitasking exercise program, walking, which involves balance, which involves visual motor skills, and which involves cognitive skills. And we can blend all of these together. We can have, we can focus on one skill more than the other skills. And we have a wide range of different types of visual motor and cognitive skills that we can add to the walking. Treadmill is a really nice workstation. Uh, it has railings for safety. We have a, not shown here, we have a body harness, so you cannot fall while you're doing this. Um, ultimately, our goal is to be able to have a station like this transition into community centers like the wellness, like the refit, like the Rady, uh, and other exercise centers. Because we're using a computer and an instrumented treadmill, we can monitor your performance. We can monitor what you're doing. And by doing that, we can see if it's safe and if you're stable and if you're exceeding some threshold. So it has a lot of value. Uh, it's totally unobtrusive. All you have to do is to wear a baseball hat or a plastic hair band. The mouse is miniature and we can also use a plastic hair band. The females prefer often the plastic hair band. So here we have this exercise training program that we're going to uh, use as, a, as an intervention. We're gonna examine the effect of this training program in a 10 week time period. We're gonna compare this program to um, uh, other programs, cardio and muscle fitness programs. And we're going to look at how it impacts on our balance our gait functions, our visual motor and our cognitive functions, and our um, participation level in life and our quality of life. Now, the other value that we have to this study is that we're gonna use this functional brain imaging technique. Dr. Cole will go into more detail. This PET imaging is, is, is an interesting way of, and one of the, the few ways of imaging the brain while you're walking on the treadmill. The technique requires three stages. It involves the first stage is, um, and pen imaging um, is a diagnostic tool. It's a standardized diagnostic tool now for many different pathologies. We will use it in our study to look at brain activity during walking in people with Parkinson pathology and comparing that to healthy to see where the where the where the problem areas are and to look at how the to look at brain plasticity. Um, if we can impact on mobility skills with this intervention and other cardiac and musculoskeletal interventions, how does the brain activity change? So we can look at brain, brain plasticity, at least start to begin to look at the site and how, it, how it's happening. 
Now, the first thing that has to happen in this brain imaging is to be injected with a, sm a very small amount of glucose. The glucose is labeled with a radioactive isotope. When, and then the next stage is that you have to walk on the treadmill for 25 minutes with and without dual tasking in a standardized format. The areas of the brain are that are responsible for the walking, producing the walking and the visual motor and the cognitive activities, they will absorb the glucose. The brain work will absorb the energy of the glucose. And it will end up in, at the end of 25 minutes, there'll be lots of, lots of the glucose uptake in the areas of the brain that are responsible for gait and cognition. So we take you over to the scanner, a couple minutes, you're in the scanner, and then we can scan the brain to look at where the, the radioactive label is in your brain. And you can see the little cartoon there, and you can see that during, we can actually look at the brain activity, um, brain work while you're walking. And you can notice that there are many areas of the brain are going to be active when you're producing behaviors like walking and performing visual motor activities and performing information processing activities. So the amount of brain work, how it's organized, how it's orchestrated um, and, and the areas themselves and whether or not we can see changes as a function of different types of intervention is what we will do in this study. And that's, I think, all I have to say. There's a lot of information there and a sort of a novel um, um, exercise problem. Thank you, Dr. Sturm. It sounds like the, the outcomes of this uh, training program intervention will, be, intervention will be very interesting. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. You're welcome. So I will uh, ask uh, if you can make your remarks, please. Thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, my name is Jihan Ko. I'm an associate professor in the hum uh, human anatomy and cell science. I use uh, brain imaging tools to, to understand uh, what is uh, going on in, in Parkinson's disease. So my uh, main area of research focus is on uh, cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease. So the first thing, the first, the, the number one goal for me to use the brain imaging is to understand the underlying neuro, neurophysiological mechanism of the disease. So for example, if you look at the, the top right corner of the, uh, of the slide, you can see that this nice uh, picture of the brain. And this is basically the brain re, uh, regions that we found that uh, happens to be uh, uh, associated with a cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease. Because when you th think about the Parkinson's disease, you only think about the dopaminergic uh, degeneration. However, uh, the cognitive dysfunction or cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease is not uh, just attributable to the dopaminergic uh, degeneration, but um, but the uh, uh, but it's related with the overall uh, brain network, and and then we found that uh, this uh, prefrontal uh, this part of the brain region is uh, actually crucial for uh, Parkinson's disease uh, cognitive impairment. So the next goal is to, uh, for using brain imaging is to validate the underlying neurophysiological mechanism of a novel treatment. For example, as Dr. Stum uh, already uh, talked about, we are using this uh, technique to uh, uh, show that this uh, 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 treadmill, the, the dual task treadmill exercise can eventually, uh, it can increase this uh, uh, brain function in, in the, uh, in the brain regions that we think it is important for cognitive impairment as well as uh, uh, walking, because it turns out that uh, the walking and cognitive, uh, cog the, the prefrontal cortex here in, in this part of the brain region is involved with both walking and uh, 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 cognitive, exactly cognitive function. And another uh, uh, study that I'm actually uh, uh, doing uh, nowadays is to see if uh, stimulating with a non-invasive electrical current on, on, on the part of the brain region that we think it is important for cognitive function and see if uh, that stimulation can uh, uh, improve the cognitive function in Parkinson's disease patients. So these, 
uh, two are the, the clinical trials that uh, we have been uh, planning to do. And, and I hope that we can start uh, as soon as the, the COVID restriction is lifted. And, uh, and finally, uh, and, and the not the least important is, uh, is to develop a, the, develop a complementary diagnostic and prognostic tool. For example, uh, for now, the, the diagnosis and the, the clinical examination is uh, 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 quite uh, uh, is based on the, the, the physician's assessment. And, and, and uh, we believe that uh, uh, with uh, this uh, more advanced brain imaging technique, we can do a little bit better. Um, uh, so for example, the, the study that I am uh, conducting nowadays is to, uh, to see if, uh, which patient will progress faster in terms of uh, 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 cognitive impairment. So because uh, there are a lot of uh, patients with Parkinson's disease eventually uh, develop dementia later uh, stage in, in their uh, uh, life. And, and, but some patients uh, will probably stay uh, dementia free like for the, for the rest of the life, but some patients may develop dementia in 10 years after the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Some patients may develop maybe within one year of uh, uh, Parkinson's disease diagnosis. So the goal of uh, my current research is to see uh, if we can predict who is going to develop dementia uh, in the next three years, for example. So uh, in order to do that, I use a uh, uh, pretty large data database of uh, uh, brain imaging uh, and uh, using some uh, like a machine learning technique uh, to to build a classifier, and in that way we can quantitatively assess uh, these brain, different brain imaging uh, data sets. Um, so that's uh, all I have to say for now, and I'm happy to take any questions in the question period. Thank you, Dr. Ko. Um, so the next uh, portion of the um, the evening, then I will. I will check and see the questions that come in and we'll start asking questions of the panelists. So I have a question here uh, from Sue. Um, how common is it to have very little, if any, tremor? Most troublesome system is balance and gait, rigidity and slowness. So it's not directed to anyone, any, uh, anyone in particular. So uh, I'll feel free to Okay, great. Okay. So uh, the answer is about 20% of people with Parkinson's don't have tremor. As I mentioned earlier, everybody with Parkinson's has slowness. Uh, some have rigidity, some have tremor, some have all three. But about 20% of people do not have tremor. Thank you. I just I'll go to the next question. And somebody wants to know if um if I, if they did have Parkinson's to participate in a clinical trial. Yeah, I can I can answer. Uh, yeah, so we we have a, a few clinical trials that the trials that are going on in Winnipeg area, and uh, 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 and and we also need to have some control subjects to to compare what we have found in Parkinson disease. So you, you don't have to have a Parkinson disease to participate in a clinical trial, but sometimes, but typically uh, we we want to have someone who are. Uh, matched with age, so maybe uh, 60 years and older, uh, mm -hmm. then they can uh, still participate in our clinical trial as a control subject uh, uh, for the studies. For, Thank you. This is Tony for, for the dual task study that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, one of the groups will be healthy age match controls, 15 to 30 individuals where we will do a complete assessment and do the brain imaging so that we have data to, to compare to individuals with Parkinson's disease. So we can see where the differences are 
to get a better understanding of of what's going on in the brain mm -hmm. as a first step in in in, in looking at um, means to perhaps uh, eliminate. <clears throat> Okay, great, thank you. Um, if somebody wants to know, um, most like somebody, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I mean, if you're particularly interested in learning more about it, uh, the Movement Disorder Clinic phone number, and please don't all phone tomorrow morning at nine, <laughs> but uh, the phone number at our clinic is 204-940-8400. Uh, and we're certainly, you could find us in the phone book. Uh, but uh, if you just asked somebody that you were interested in learning more about research, they would take your name and somebody would get back to you. Thank you very much. And I have a, a question from, I have a question from uh, Facebook, I think, FD. Anyways, um, it's timing, timing performance is known to be a good predictor of latency to disease onset in Huntington's disease. Is there a similar finding in PD? How do you think timing deficits relate to other cognitive and motor deficits that characterize PD? Um, so biomarkers or predictors of late, later disease is a huge area of research. It's very uh, big in Huntington's disease because there are studies looking at drugs that might actually potentially slow down the progression to Huntington's disease that are being tested as we speak. And so gathering information at a research basis to, to predict how quickly somebody's going to move on to get Huntington's is very important because then you can compare what's supposed to happen to what might happen, hopefully a delay in people who uh, um, are gonna progress to Huntington's disease. There isn't, there, we're not at a stage right now where we have drugs that can prevent or, or that are really even being studied in a big way to slow down the progression of Huntington's. So I would say there's less information about that particular biomarker in Parkinson's than there is in Huntington's disease. You want to add anything, Dr. Sturm and Dr. Cole? No, that's 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 about yeah. That's that's a good answer. I think it's it's tough. Biomarkers are tough. You have to have the behavioral correlates with the biomarkers. You need large samples. Uh, there's lots of variation, lots of variables to consider and control um, when you're identifying a biological marker and the behavioral aspects that that uh, you're trying to identify. It's important to get the behavioral analysis done as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that itself is not trivial. But we're getting there, you know, we're getting better. You know, the, the methods that we have to analyze in detail um, the, the control processes or the physiological processes underlying these, these things is getting better, for sure. But the biomarkers, that's, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. Is there stuff more going on in Parkinson's to identify biomarkers? Is there a lot of work going on in that area? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, it's it's ongoing in a variety of centers. I think part of the question is uh, what's going on in Toronto, and they're certainly doing a very large amount of uh, research out of Toronto. Uh, we don't mm -hmm. have a collaborator in relation to the, the research we're talking about, uh, I'm trying to remember, Dr. Strafella, is he in Toronto now? He is. Yeah. 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 So that would be the one we are connected with in Toronto. Okay. And a question from um, AP. So when will we catch up to the FUS studies that are happening in the US in the spring? And have just happened in Japan. They have been doing this surgery instead of DBS in Switzerland for almost a decade. They use FUS to treat rigidity there. So I'm not frankly sure what FUS stands for. They're doing focused ultrasound, so I, I suspect that's what the question's about. Uh, mm -hmm. 
focused ultrasound is a treatment that began in Israel. It's currently being studied and being used clinically as a treatment in Toronto as well as Calgary in Canada. Uh, the idea is, if you imagine using a magnifying glass to focus the energy of the sun and burning a hole in a tabletop, uh, you can use high frequency ultrasound focused and burn a hole in a very focused area within the brain and not damage brain in between the ultrasound beams and the target. Uh, you don't need to operate such as surgery, but you are burning a permanent hole. So uh, the research for treating tremor suggests it's quite effective, but the long-term follow-up suggests that the benefit starts to wane within a year or two. So it isn't, it doesn't have the same long-term benefit for use in tremor as deep brain stimulation does. Side effects are higher. Uh, there's about a 15% chance of a persistent numbness or tingling on the side they're operating with focused ultrasound. The risk of that is about 3% with implanting a deep brain stimulator. Uh, as far as Parkinson's disease, uh, although uh, it is being used to treat tremor in Parkinson's. We don't yet know the science, or in other words, the potential benefit side effects for managing rigidity and uh, tremor in a robust study, although there's some studies starting to be published. At this point, it's not something I would recommend for people with Parkinson's disease. I, I need more information to know if it's a good idea. Dr. Sturb and Dr. Coe, anything to add to that response? Uh, I don't have anything. Okay. Yeah, so basically the uh, before the DBS was used, the people used to just to do the lesion. And, and, and I guess uh, focus ultrasound might be better than lesion, but as uh, Dr. Hobson said, if you compare it with a DBS, uh, I guess the, the jury is still working on it. If somebody is older and there are reasons that they might not be able to tolerate having electrodes implanted, then it becomes more of an option earlier on for treating tremor. Mm -hmm. It's still something that's considered, I think, experimental for Parkinson's disease. Thank you. That's actually a really good segue to the next question. Um, from Janet Jones. Could you talk about deep brain stim stimulation as a treatment option for someone in their 70s? I realize that is close to the cutoff age. So uh, age 70 is considered a bit of a cutoff, but uh, I think most centers recognize it's, it's not the age itself, but it's the overall condition, the health of the patient generally. Uh, really quite specifically, it's based on the cognition uh, testing of the patient. If there are memory problems going in, uh, then the chance of deep brain stimulation or frankly focused ultrasound making memory considerably worse after the procedure is so high that it wouldn't be recommended in patients with memory troubles. It just correlates with age. So the older you are, especially as you get over the age of 70, the risks start to go up. And depending on the overall expected lifespan, the risk benefit over the person's lifetime may not justify a potentially dangerous procedure. There's another part to that question. I know that was it. I'm just waiting to see if Dr. Cohen, Dr. Storm have anything to add? No. Okay. No, no. Okay, thank you. Okay, and um, the next question from Suzanne. What are your thoughts regarding an increase in young onset PD? I've heard that even correcting for an aging population, there is an increase of cases. Uh, we've looked at the numbers in Manitoba, uh, generally, not specifically young onset. And uh, the condition is being diagnosed more often because people are older and because there's more people. 
But when you actually look at the overall likelihood of this being diagnosed per individual, the rates aren't actually going higher. Uh, the reason there's more around per population is probably because they're living longer and they are being diagnosed earlier because doctors are able to recognize the symptoms earlier uh, because of people like Michael J. Fox educating the public. People are presenting earlier than they might otherwise with their symptoms. So I think that's why it looks like more younger people are being diagnosed. I don't really think it means more younger people actually have the disease. So does that mean that in the past we underrepresented um, how many people we had in the young onset group because they were being diagnosed later? Yeah, there's a tendency, if you were 30 and you went into a family doctor with a bit of tremor, they wouldn't think of Parkinson's as quickly as a general practitioner. Whereas if you got in to see a neurologist, they'd still think of Parkinson's disease. So there, there's a probably an error in reporting that as family doctors are getting better at recognizing this and being educated at med school about how young people can get this disease as well. So about 10% of patients get it under the age of 45. And the more we educate the doctors, the younger doctors are gonna pick up on these patients earlier. So it's gonna look like there's more around. I'm not sure we definitely have evidence that there are more around. Okay. So I have a question here from Lisa Fernandez. What are the best types of exercise for PD patients with apathy? Dr. Stern, did you want to take that? Um, with apathy? <laughs> apathy. Apathy. Um, yeah. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I don't have a lot of experience with that area. Um, okay. Um, what, you know, one of the things that, that Parkinson effects is our emotional state, our effective mm -hmm. coloring of things. Um, so motiv getting motivating, getting motivated to do something is, is hard. Um, again, you know, you really want to try something, you want to find something that in the past you really, really like to do. That's, that, that's engaging, that's interactive, that's fun. And if you can find something like that, you're more likely to participate in that exercise. And I'm sure that exercise is gonna have value either to your cardiac fitness, your muscle and bone fitness, uh, and your balance and, and, and neuro fitness in general. Now, will it have, you know, um, the, the amount of benefit it has on balance or gait or visual motor or cognition or cardiac or, or, um, or, or muscle may vary, but you know it's going to have some impact on all aspects of, of those things. Uh, again, we use computer games. One of the reasons why we use computer games, we do a lot of work with children as well, mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to engage people in tedious exercises that are required in the long term. Um, and uh, computer games are engaging for some people and. Mm -hmm they're more likely to participate in exercise if they're having fun. And that's why we use it. I mean, another reason why we use computer games is, uh, is because of the computer and our ability to monitor what the individual is doing. If we're gonna transition these type, any type of exercise, but whether or not it's cardiac or muscle or neural or balance or cognitive, we're gonna transition these to the home or to community center or to rural. It's, it's really important that we can monitor what you, what the, what the patient or the individual is doing so we can help support them, so we can help progress their program. And that's easy to do with the proper telemonitoring tools. Mm -hmm. But again, the exercises, uh, I mean, if you wanna learn to walk, you gotta walk. If you wanna learn to balance, you've gotta be put out of balance. If you wanna, you know, if you wanna learn to move, use your hands, you gotta use your hands. So we take a task specific approach um, and typically, when you're looking at the dynamics, the biomechanics, the physics of all of this, it's complicated. Um, walking is very complicated. Walking itself is a cognitive function. It's not really a simple motor function or a reflex function. It's really a cognitive function. There's lots of 
planning, lots of brain processing required um, for walking, for safe, independent walking in the environment, in complex terrains, et cetera, et cetera. And if you want to, you know, if you want to actually get physical activity in terms of leisure and sport and recreation, there's even more and more and more. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Hobson, how do you deal with that? I would refer to the speaker that just answered the question before me. <laughs> we have a physiotherapist in the clinic, and uh, so, uh, I would utilize her expertise in any individual case. Uh, I wouldn't make the decision about what exercise to do. I'd rely on the physiotherapist to assess the patient and come up with the, the best approach. Okay. Dr. Cole, do you have um, something to add? Uh, no, that's not. okay. Um, so the next question is from Trish Is anyone running trials on the Helios medical technology ponds device for balance, mobility problems related to PD or other diseases here in Manitoba? Uh, not that I know of, and not that I know of. I'm not exactly sure what this device is, to tell you the truth. It can it be a little more explained, and then I might be able to comment on whether or not what I think about it. Okay, sure. Maybe that um, the person asking the question maybe can uh, can ask the problem. You know, can you can email me. Yeah, you know, you can find my name and email me. No problem. I can I can talk about it. There's lots okay. of aspect. Yeah, there's lots of devices out there. Mm -hmm. I see. There's a new device by. Um, by a company called Great Lakes that helps monitor tremor with a with a mobile phone. So a lot of devices for monitoring things. Um, Are there a lot of devices for also collecting clinical data? Um, like uh, I guess disease information from the for the where so, and transferring that information to the neurologist. Are there a lot of devices out there like that? Yes, there's, well, there's uh, more. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, there's a lot of different companies producing iPhone and other mm -hmm. Android apps for people to monitor their symptoms. Uh, some of them that potentially could send information to their neurologist to assist trying to figure out how they are at home as opposed to making decisions based on only their history and what you see in the office. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure they've reached the point of being particularly useful as yet, uh, although the companies that are producing them because they're selling the apps are probably doing well financially. I think the science is lagging behind the number of apps that are available. So you have to be a little careful uh, in relation to how much you're going to invest in these things. Talk with your neurologist or your doctor to, to find out if it's going to in fact be useful. Um, going back to the ponds, I've certainly heard of it. I would mm -hmm. caution people because, again, it's something that uh, there's a lot of products out there without much science behind it that are being offered at a price to patients in clinics. And, and you have to be careful how much you're going to pay for something that isn't at the point of standard of care. And so if no one's providing this as a treatment in Manitoba, it kind of suggests it's not yet reached a stage where it's considered standard of care. Okay. Thank you. I have a comment about that in terms of monitoring condition like tremor. I think you have to be a little careful. It's like the stock market. You can't get excited over one test time period or two time periods or three time periods. So when you're monitoring, Typically, you have to monitor over a fairly lengthy time period, and it's the information averaged over that time period that's important. And the other thing is that you know you have to be careful when you're being when you're timing your monitoring that you're on the the pill at the same time. It's the same time of day. You're not fatigued. You didn't do something uh, in the yard, you know, an hour ago. So you have to standardize certain things when you're recording physical activities. Uh, tremor, rigidity, balance, gait, etc. And typically, you you really need to monitor over time over a time period before it's useful. But it can be useful, for, and it can help um, monitor 
um, your condition and your medication effects, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. And I have a question from Sue. Is it because of government red tape that there are many more PD medications available in the US than here in Canada? Um, perhaps a question to ask your local politician. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure quite how to define government red tape. I can say that there have been drugs that have been approved in Canada, one specifically called Domperidone that we had for 30 years available to us before it was approved in the States. So there, to some extent, it all depends on application. So there are companies that produce Parkinson's pills in the United States who have never frankly applied to have it in the Canadian market. So it's not the government of Canada's fault. The company's not actually put the effort into trying to market in Canada. Canada is a relatively small country and they make the decision that it may not be worth trying to market it in Canada. And that's what their investors have told them. Uh, there are certainly uh, drugs down there that I would very much like to have in Canada. One of them's a long acting Parkinson's pill. Uh, currently, there's a Parkinson's pill called Cinnamon CR that's been around since 1989. It's a very erratically absorbed pill that I don't find particularly useful. But there's a drug in the States called Riteri that we were actually part of the clinical trial of it, and it was proven to work and provide a very nice, smooth blood level for a long period of time. Something that I would put most of my patients on very quickly if I had it available. And uh, as far as I know, the company has not yet applied to have it looked at as a Canadian product. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hobson. And I have a question from um, LA. How can we ensure that more doctors are trained to recognize the early PD symptoms, such as loss of smell, to ultimately lead to more to a more timely diagnosis? Good question. So we've got to educate them early. Uh, so at the med school level, uh, the challenge during the pandemic and even before is there is a general tendency for people to watch lectures from home. Uh, as opposed to coming into the lecture hall, as I said, even before the pandemic. So the class size is 100 and I might have 15 people in the room. Uh, and that's not because they don't like me, that's kind of like an average turnout for some of the lectures. Uh, but the more we can teach them at an early level and the more movement disorder specialists that are available to teach them, the better, the more rotations that they do through the movement disorder clinic, uh, the better. Uh, so we now have, uh, well, by uh, July, we'll have four movement disorder neurologists in our clinic, all of which participate actively in teaching at the university. So we're working on it. Uh, there's also a variety of uh, continuing medical education events that are available for family doctors who are already out there to get updated in different areas, but pretty dependent on them making sure they're, they're doing that on a regular basis. Doctors learn a lot from patients. Uh, so uh, to some extent, uh, you can do a good job of updating your own doctor or even asking them questions that encourage them to get themselves uh, to learn more. So that's that's part of the push to, to help them get educated as well. Thank you, Dr. Hobson. Uh, Dr. Cohen, Dr. Sturm? No, good. Okay, no, good. thank you. Okay, and this question is for Dr. Sturm. Uh, do we still have, do we still like forced exercise to reduce tremor? I uh, in bracket tandem biking, for instance, and how does dance or boxing benefit uh, motor control? Um, tremor, tremor is a tough one. Tremor is a tough one, and it's something that's that um, we don't know. We, we we don't have a lot of information how 
any one exercise affects trauma. I know that if we run a client on a treadmill, treadmill walk, and then start getting them to do visual motor and cognitive activities while walking, we often see huge increases in the amount of tremor. So these things can bring tremor on, whether or not it's it's helping it in the long run, we don't know. Any any activity, any bipedal locomotion activity has a, a fairly dynamic balance component to it and a motor coordination component to it. And if you're walking outdoors and you're walking on say grass or uneven ground, that itself has a, a much greater balance component to it. Uh, the speed that, that, that you walk increases the balance challenge and the motor coordination challenge. Um, multitasking, walking and tracking information, walking in a busy environment, in a, in a mall with lots of people around, lots of obstacles around, all these things are good for your ability to 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 make good decisions prior to losing your balance. And that's important. Um, being able to prepare yourself for for the conditions that you're going to that, that are going to be difficult is an important issue, especially when your balance control is limited or reduced because of Parkinson. So you need to strategize a little bit when you're walking. But walking, again, you're not going to learn balance responses, balance control without walking. If you're doing it on a bike, there isn't the forces at your knee, your hip, your ankle, you're not in a position to lose your balance. So you're not gonna learn anything about balance on your bicycle. But on a bicycle, you're gonna get good cardiac fitness and you're gonna get leg muscle endurance and strength. That's why we use a treadmill. The treadmill, when you're doing these exercises on the treadmill, you're drifting in space, you're losing your balance a little bit, you're stumbling a little bit, so you're experiencing these disturbances. That's the first stage in identifying so that you can sense that disturbances are occurring. You're not going to balance unless you can sense the disturbances happening. So actually producing stumbles is a good thing in a controlled graded fashion, of course, in a treadmill mm -hmm. gives you that control. But yet the challenge of producing these stumbles, you have to be able to assess it. So your sensory processing is critical and then your decision making. Once you feel that you're losing your balance, you have to do something about it. You have to make a correction. And it's a whole body response, it's not a simple response. It involves all the muscles of your body, all your leg, all your trunk, your pelvis, etc. So these are complex uh, control processes, and you're not going to develop them unless you're walking, unless you're also losing your balance while you're walking. Mm -hmm. Now you've got to remember that it it took you 12 months, maybe 18 months, to learn to walk. And the reason why is not because you couldn't produce the leg movements, is because of the balance problems that bipedal locomotion have. It takes a long time to learn to balance. Unfortunately, almost all neurological conditions, Parkinson's, stroke, head injuries, peripheral neuropathy with diabetes, vestibular disorders, concussions, all these disorders are gonna cause balance problems. Balance is such a huge complex phenomena that requires a lot of real estate a lot of brain real estate to, to produce so that effectively so that you can be physically active. You can do your yard work, you can you can you can run, you can you can do your, your chores, you can do your leisure activities, you can golf, you can play tennis, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You can cross country ski. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hobson, Dr. Salt? I don't have anything to add. I think you missed a question though. There was a question about DBS above the last one you asked and that was whether or not DBS could help balance. Okay. And uh, deep brain stimulation is uh, really strikingly effective for tremor. It can really help to reduce dyskinetic movements. Uh, you're able to reduce your pills by about 50% 
With regard to balance, it probably helps balance for the first six months after the procedure, but uh, long-term studies suggest it probably doesn't make much difference compared to not having DBS after that first six months. So balance is a very stubborn problem. It doesn't get much better with pills. And uh, if you don't see improvement in the symptom with the medication, it's not likely that the deep brain stimulation is going to help either. The deep brain stimulation mimics the effect of the medication. The big difference is DBS is in the background all of the time once the machine is turned on. And so it really helps even the response out, but it doesn't work better than the pills. Thank you. I agree. I think that, you know, in the early stages, DBS does make a difference. We've seen mm -hmm. individuals with DBS with and without their stimulator on, and, and their balance is much better in the early stages, much better when the DBS is on. But after a while, um, the balance is, it, it declines. It, it just does. Um, and unless you do something to increase your capacity mm -hmm. to recognize the balance threat, and the ability to process information and produce balanced reactions, i.e., unless you stay active mm -hmm. in, 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 in certain ways, yes, you know, and, and the more sedentary you become, um, because it's hard, it's difficult, it's difficult to maintain safe, independent ambulation as the, the disease progresses into stage three and especially into stage four. So it's not safe and it's it's hard. You don't want to fall and you fall. A lot of part of patients fall a lot. Um, and it's it's hard and you become afraid of it. And for five, six months of the year, we have winter, we have cold weather. Um, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You know, it's my patients, just, just an aside, a lot of my mm -hmm. patients tell me, you know, this is one thing I hear a lot and I have to say this and they say, Aging isn't for sissies. Healthy aging isn't for sissies. You've got to work at it. You just do. If you want to maintain your mobility and to be physically active, um, um, you, you do. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And so the next question from Smith uh, for Dr. Sturm. Oh, no, we just, we just asked that. Okay, so... Uh, the next one from Suzanne, Dr. Stern, what type of exercise would you recommend, cardio in particular, for a PD patient who has limited mobility due to leg and foot pain issues, i.e. sprains? Yeah, that's one of the problems. In order, to, in order to have good cardiovascular effect, in, in order to get your heart rate up to about 60% of your age uh, maximum, um, you have to produce work and um, uh, energy. You have to produce resistance and work. And the best way to do that is to use your large muscles of your legs, walking, cycling, ellipticals. Um, for, for pain in knee and ankle, you know, it, it's tough. You know, recumbent cycles are good if you can tolerate recumbent cycling and you can get the resistance and the, and the speed of cycling up. You'll get good cardio, uh, cardiovascular fitness and leg endurance as well. Ellipticals for some people are really good as well. There's no contact. Uh, you're using your upper body a lot, not just your lower limbs. So ellipticals are really good. Uh, if you if you have the balance and you have the upper arm strength, cycle or uh, hand ergometers are also very good. But again, you have to produce work, muscle work, and in order to get your your heart rate up high enough to to have a, a, a modest cardiovascular fitness effect. And that's one of the problems when you lose mobility. You're just you just can't get enough physical activity to get that cardiac effect, and then also to get that muscle endurance effect. So there's, you know, there's a connection between losing mobility, affecting your cardiovascular fitness and affecting your muscle endurance. And then it spirals a little bit. Dr. Swimming is another one, you know, if you can get into the water and you can go swimming, swimming is a, another really good exercise. Thank you. 
an endurance exercise. And swimming uh, uh, water aerobics is a good exercise. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that with one uh, little bit of information. So if you could swim when you were younger and you've had Parkinson's for a while and you decide to take up swimming, don't assume you can still swim. <laughs> Uh, so don't jump off in water start, because it takes a while to get that pattern movement back. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, and if you could never swim, uh, probably not a good idea to start. Uh, start yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's an excellent exercise for people with joint problems because you, the weight is supported by the water and it really allows a lot of people who otherwise couldn't exercise very much to really get a very good, good exercise. Thank you, great tips. And so we'll go to the next question uh, from uh, Adil Sulman. Um, so sorry. This is, this is one that I saw part of earlier. Oh, I think okay. they back more in. To it. Um, so we talked about DBS, which is deep brain stimulation, electrodes into the subthalamic nucleus, typically done on both sides and it can help balance for about six months. Question also asks, does it help dyskinesia? I did answer that. Because it usually allows you to lower the doses of medication, dyskinesia usually gets a lot better. Restless legs, if uh, your Parkinson's is bad, it's making you stiff. Quite often people will have a restlessness of it. Uh, they'll not only have just restless legs, but they'll often have a, an urge just to simply get up and move around from a whole body sense. That often is markedly improved after DBS. And I've lot you switched off the question. There was another sentence uh, talking about having had it for 11 years, uh, and he wanted to know what computer games you could use or what you use, Tony. So uh, I'll give that up to you. It, 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 it all depends what, what, what you're using a computer game for. If you're using a computer game for, for cognition, um, uh, there's lots. There's lots of commercial games that are, that, that, that are, that are inexpensive. If you go to a, a website called Big Fish Games, there's 100 uh, arcade-style games. You just have to try them out, and you have to see if the problem-solving component in that game or the matching component in that game, or the uh, precision component in that game is something that challenges you. Um, there are brain fitness sites. Um, a couple of good ones are Happy Neuron is a good uh, is a good site. Um, um, Sharp Brains uh, is a good site. Uh, Neuronation is another good site. They have dedicated, purpose-built cognitive games for memory for visual attention, visual search, executive function, and some of them, a lot of them aren't games for the for the purpose-built cognitive sites. They're more flashcardy type stuff. I prefer games that are games that are fun, a little harder to find. But yeah, we we have identified a number of them. Um, in terms of balance games and motor games, um, it's not so much the game that's important. It's the movement that you do in the game. So if you're sitting there and you're playing a game by moving your wrist, that's not going to help your balance. If you're sitting there and you're walking on a treadmill and playing the cognitive game, that's going to help your balance. If you're using a connect and you're actually moving fast and large amplitude while you're playing the game, that's going to help your balance. It's the physical space. It's the movement that you do that's critical to balance cardiovascular fitness, muscle fitness, not so much the game. The game is there to make your activity more engaging. The game is there to make the game more cognitively challenging so that you're multi multitasking. And the game is there in, in our respect to help us monitor what you're doing so we can get you doing it on your own time, in your own place quicker, but yet still have the clinical specialist monitor you. Dr. Sturm, for the dual task study, um, are you using the same computer game for all participants? No, no, we individualize the program. If 
uh, for two reasons. Number one, some people don't like some games and they like other games. So there's no sense asking someone to do something they don't like because they're not going to focus and they're not going to want to do it. So we first of all, we try to find games that people enjoy or find challenging. And then, you know, we scope it out. We scope it out. We do a cognitive assessment um, and we find out what aspects of cognition um, you're having trouble with. And those are the ones that we use in the computer game. Mm -hmm. um, and again, there's many different elements or aspects of cognition or types of executive cognitive functions. There's many different types of brain work, information processing that we have to do. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not all affected the same way in everybody. And they're very different. Some, but some people can be, you know, have a super sharp brain and not have any cognitive problems. But their ability to track an object or do visual motor tasks is very poor. So it depends. So we 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 individualize the program. And because you. we use commercial games, we have a large variety. And mm -hmm. That's critical. That's very mm -hmm. important. Okay, so I have the next question from Trish. I am wondering if slow movement of Tai Chi might help with PD by imagery and physical exercise. But currently, I currently return to Tai Chi after a slip on ice and I need to regain my confidence and balance. Well, so Tai Chi is good for certain things. Go ahead, Doug. Well, I was just gonna say Tai Chi is one of the uh, potential exercise techniques that has evidence-based medicine supporting it is useful for Parkinson's disease. So uh, I would recommend it. Yes. The only problem with Tai Chi, it's, 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 it, it doesn't, it, 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 it's good for core balance. It's good for stability with your base of support stationary. It doesn't flow, it doesn't transform very well to walking conditions, more dynamic, where you're actually moving your base of support. So the dynamics and the, and the requirements of walking are very different than activities with your base of support stationary. You're, you're really building muscle strength in your, in your feet and your ankle muscles with Tai Chi really well. In fact, yoga is another one that's really good for that. Um, but in terms of dynamics and being able to manage ice, um, that's a very, you know, that's a very difficult situation to do. I fall every year on ice. Um, if you put your foot down in the wrong way, on, a, on, on an ice, there's very little you can do to stop yourself from falling. Um, but your ability to soften the blow with your arms and et cetera is a very important part of falling. So fall, knowing to fall well is important. Yeah, and walking is very different. So Tai Chi is good for some things, um, muscle strength, especially your lower legs and core balance. Um, it may not have a large cardiovascular effect and it may not have a dynamic effect. Okay, and uh, another exercise question. Um, when is it beneficial to use walking poles for balance? Um, if, if you're looking at physical activity in general, and you're looking at cardiovascular muscle strength uh, and some core balance, um, and, and you're more comfortable with walking sticks. My wife uses walking sticks. She's more comfortable walking and we walk every night. Um, she probably wouldn't walk a lot in the winter time without walking sticks. So it's a good thing to have. It's, you know, it's a safety valve. Uh, and if it gets you out and being physically active, it's great. Um, the balance requirements when you're using poles is less, of course. Uh, anytime you're holding on to something, um, if you're holding, if you're standing and holding onto a desk or a chair, the balance requirements are much less. So the balance training that you're getting is going to be less. But walking outdoors with poles has still has a good balance requirement. And again, physical activity is important. Cardiovascular fitness is important. Mm -hmm. Getting fresh air is important. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I have a question from AP, uh, Makuna, which has natural 
levodopa in it has been has been much more effective than any other PD pharmaceuticals for my dad. Why do not why do not enough neurologists hear um, hear about it hear know about it? And why uh, why is it more difficult to source in Canada than the U.S. So, as stated in the question, levodopa is a naturally occurring substance. The pharmaceutical companies have managed to purify it, put it in a pill such that we know when we give the person a pill exactly the amount of levodopa they're getting. I can't tell, I give a patient a prescription for a certain amount of lacuna and know exactly what they're getting. Um, so, from a neurologic point of view, I think patients are much safer taking a prescribed amount. Uh, it, it is a natural substance. It just happens to be being produced and sold by a pharmaceutical company. Uh, but it is the drug that we need. It's replacing dopamine directly. So is that plant product. But it's harder to know exactly. Depends on who's selling it, where they're getting it, exactly how many milligrams. So for me as a neurologist to know if, if you're getting side effects on it, what to do differently with it makes it extremely difficult to, uh, to titrate for an individual patient. I, I don't know the reason that it's not being available in Canada as much as other countries. Uh, maybe there's not the same demand in Canada because we have pretty good access to pharmaceuticals and in many provinces patients get the, the prescriptions paid for. There are certainly a lot of other countries where you actually can't get levodopa, so you're much more dependent on finding whatever could work. And I know there are certain countries where that product is being used fairly widely uh, because of the limitation on actually getting uh, pharmaceuticals. Thank you very much. And um, the next question is from uh, Katarina. Anything you recommend for sleep disturbances like certain exercises before bedtime? Um, so it's difficult, I think, to answer that question because there are potentially a lot of people listening and I would say it's a very individualized decision based on what other medical problems the patient might have, what other pills they're on. But if we just try to globally answer the question, uh, uh, there are non-pill ways of improving sleep and exercise, not necessarily immediately before falling in bed, but making sure you're active through the day, making sure if you do need a nap, you try to limit it to about a half an hour during the day, because if you sleep much longer than that, you're not going to be sleepy enough to fall asleep at night. One of the medications we typically would start with would be melatonin, over-the-counter naturally occurring chemical in the brain. Um, dose varies depending on the individual, but the starting dose, if you don't have medical advice, would be don't take it. <laughs> Wait <laughs> until you talk to your doctor and let them guide you as to how to take it. There are prescription medications. There's a host of different ones that we might consider using. It really depends on what's preventing you from falling asleep. Sometimes it's very difficult to sort that out. Occasionally, the Parkinson's symptoms are bad, like tremor. And so adjusting the Parkinson's pills like levodopa to make sure your Parkinson's is well treated when you're trying to fall asleep would be the best approach. So it's something to talk to your doctor about. And sometimes you don't want to do exercise to fatigue yourself to sleep. Sometimes you want to do exercise to relax yourself and to free your mind. And sometimes going out and just using your poles and getting out and walking around outside is, and just learning, uh, exercising for clearing your mind and for relaxing is, and relaxing techniques sometimes in general are, are good things as well. Yoga, for example. Mm -hmm. So we're down to the last um, about five minutes of uh, the evening. I was uh, wondering if you can, if you have any last remarks that you would like to um, to tell tell the, our audience. So, uh, Dr. Hobson. 
potentially we might all end up saying the same thing, but I think exercise is huge. Uh, uh, human as well as animal studies suggesting you can slow down how fast Parkinson's progresses, not to mention aging in general. Uh, but for Parkinson's disease, if you can leave this meeting with any information, uh, the more active physically you can be, the better you're going to do for a variety of reasons uh, over the years. And one thing I've noticed, go ahead. Go ahead. One thing I've noticed in, 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 in performing exercise with Parkinson patients that people who are taking their medications on a regular basis, well-controlled, systematic, or their DBS is well-controlled and systematic, they'll perform much better and they'll be able to be much more active and be able to produce more activity, more cardio, more muscle, more balance. So the medication and the DBS controls, um, when you're di you know, when you're being prescribed these things, sticking to the regimen is very important. Dr. Cole? Yeah, so one thing that I noticed uh, in, during the, uh, the the question period was that there was something about like a computer game, how it could improve the cognitive function. And, mm -hmm. and the thing is that uh, the, the problem with those uh, commercialized computer games is that their transferability has not been really, uh, it's not really uh, verified in, in terms of uh, how, training on those computer games does not necessarily mean that it will uh, improve their daily life cognitive function. So that kind of things needs to be researched. And that's why we are mm -hmm. doing this type of clinical research to figure mm -hmm. out the underlying mechanism of those novel treatment on, on patients. And, and, and uh, so we really need uh, uh, patient volunteers and, and non-patient volunteers in our research to to further improve the, the types of treatment that we can offer um, in the clinic. And um, just on that, on that um, note, uh, if you are looking for patient, uh, for participants, research participants, please do contact Practice in Canada. We can put it out through our, our communication channels as well for uh, recruiting people with Parkinson's or, or, or uh, or, you know, just people for, for PV research. Correct. You can, like Doug said, you can contact the mm -hmm. Movement Disorders Clinic. They have our, our, our information then can forward it to you. You can email me. Uh, if you can remember how to spell my last name, it's Polish. It's got a Z in it, S-Z-T-U-R-M. It's encrypted. Or Dr. Ko, um, and we begin more than happy to inform you of what's going on and, and the logistics of it, et cetera. Perfect. Okay, so thank you so much. In closing, I'd like to thank you all for engaging in tonight's discussion. I thank you to, to our expert panel members and to the audience. And I hope that you found it informative and got as much out of it as I did. It was, it, I really enjoyed this, um, um, the uh, information from the uh, panel experts. And I encourage you to, uh, to tune in again on April 15th for our next topic scientific titled Body Donors, the Silent Health Educators. Details on this and additional cafe scientific can be found at uofmanitoba.ca slash cafe scientific, as well as the link to tonight's video. Thank you again and good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you Thank all tuning in.